Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Shirley Gatanyo Gable. I am a professor and the Marianne Caranta Endowed Chair for Social Justice for Children at Fordham University's Graduate School of Social Service. As many of you are aware, April is National Child Abuse Prevention Month. National Child Abuse Prevention Month was established to recognize the importance of families and communities working together to prevent child abuse and neglect. Across the US this month, we highlight prevention services and supports in place to help protect children and produce thriving families. It is fitting as well that we give appreciation for the workers delivering preventive services and supports to families. It is with this in mind that we turn our attention this afternoon to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the workers who have been working with children and families throughout the pandemic. These professionals work with families and children while facing their own uncertainties and hardships during the COVID-19 crisis. Not only were they regularly exposed to the traumas of the families and children they worked with, but they too dealt with the stress and loss in their own lives. Many child and family professionals have experienced vicarious traumatic traumatization, also called secondary traumatic stress. We've assembled an all-star panel today to share their expertise on vicarious trauma and self-care during COVID-19. Although we are seeing the light at the end of this dark year, many of the effects of the pandemic may stay with us for some time. And it is important that we acknowledge this and learn to care for ourselves as professionals so that we can best serve others. In the month of April, we will be offering three self-care lunchtime sessions on Zoom for free in appreciation of the dedication of all those who are working to create better lives for children and families. More on this will be shared at the end of the webinar and is on the Fordham GSS website. I'd like to now introduce um, the planning committee, uh, Mel Schneiderman and Leslie Schmerler from the New York Family, Christine, Christine Crowther, and Nancy Waxstein and myself from Fordham University Graduate School of Social Service. In putting today's panel together, um, we wanted to make sure we had representation from, um, from different kinds of professionals. And so to educate us on the kinds of efforts agencies have been making to keep professionals working with children and their families healthy, we reached out to Dr. Mary Polito. Mary is the executive director of the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. It is the first and oldest child protection agency in the world. For those of you working in child welfare, Mary is a well-known leader in New York City and New York State. Her protocol for crisis debriefing is utilized throughout the New York City Child Protective Services System. Welcome, Mary. To inform us on the research that has been going on in this area, we asked Derek, Dr. Derek Tice Brown to join us today. Derek is a faculty member at Fordham University's Graduate School of Social Service. His work focuses on helping communities and individuals cope with the anxiety and depression caused by marginalization and discrimination. The pandemic disproportionately hit black and brown children and families, exasperating the stress and trauma further in these lived communities. We look forward to learning from you today, Derek. To inform us um, and for a clinical 
clinician's perspective on what has been happening on the ground, we invited Elizabeth Liu, the clinical manager at New York Foundling. Elizabeth is a Fordham alum, woo woo, and has her MSW from Rutgers University. She has worked in residential and other settings with women and children experiencing the effects of violence and substance abuse. Elizabeth is deeply committed to helping children and families mitigate the impact of loss and trauma, something she is exposed to every day as a manager working in foster care. I will now turn to Derek, who will start us off with a relaxation exercise. Good afternoon and even good morning to some of you as I see there's people from as far as way as Chicago. We're going to start with a um, relaxation and centering exercise. And for this exercise, I'm going to invite you to um, sit in a chair um, if you're not sitting in a chair. And I'm going to ask for you to um, find some comfort in that chair. In other words, um, I'm going to ask for you to start attuning to how you are sitting in that chair. Um, are your feet comfortably uh, resting on the ground? Um, are your knees at a 90 degree angle? Uh, is your back gently leaning against the back of your chair so that your lumbar area of your spine is receiving adequate support? Um, and also attuning to how you're sitting uh, with your shoulders. Um, are your shoulders kind of hunching forward as many of us who work in front of a computer, um, our shoulders do because we're leaning over? They are, just go ahead and roll your shoulders up and back towards the back of the room and down. And you'll notice a nice relaxation um, across your shoulders and in the back of your neck. And to further relax your neck, let the crown of your head or the top of your head reach up toward uh, the ceiling of the room that you're in. And just take a moment um, in this comfortable space um, as you've given your body some time to uh, relax in your chair. And I also want to do a brief uh, breath work uh, practice with everyone. And so we'll do a little bit of um, breath counting. And for this, I'm gonna invite us to move away from our external body and inside. Um, and so to do that, um, if you feel comfortable, you can go ahead and close your eyes. Um, if you'd rather leave your eyes open, you can find um, what we call in my uh, yoga practice, um, drishti. So you can find a focal point in the room and just gently stare um, at that space. Uh, <clears throat> and so with your eyes closed or using your drishti, go ahead and take a nice deep inhale and one big exhale, which can be out of your nose or out of your mouth. And then once you've done that and you've noticed any changes in your body, we're going to actually do a little bit of breath counting. So with the brief breath counting that we'll do, we'll breathe in for one count and then we'll breathe out for three counts. Um, which will help us to further relax through exhales, deeper exhales. And so we'll do this nine times. So on your own time, on your own inhale, you'll breathe in for a count of one, and then you'll breathe out for one, two, three. Breathing in for one, breathing out for one, two, Three, breathing in for one, breathing out for one, two, three, breathing in for one, breathing out for one, two, three, halfway there, breathing in for one, breathing out for one, two, 
three, breathing in for one, breathing out for one, two, three, breathing in for one, breathing out for one, two, three, and one more time, breathing in for one, and breathing out for one, two, three. And then allowing yourself, and I'll give you a moment of silence to kind of sit with yourself with your eyes closed or just you maintained, noticing any changes that you have had in your body, any relaxation. Maybe you notice your ribs um, as you breathe in, expanding out into your arms. Maybe you even notice the beating of your heart. And as we wrap up, the, wrap up this brief <clears throat> uh, relaxation and centering exercise, I'm going to read a brief quote from you that I read this morning in my morning meditation from Sri Swami Satchitananda. Knowledge is a thing to be obtained from within by tuning in. Tuning in means to go in, to understand ourselves, to know thyself first. If we do not know ourselves, we will make mistakes in knowing other things. We should know with what glasses we are viewing the outside. Are they clean or are they colored? And so on your own time, go ahead and release your drishti or go ahead and let your eyes flutter open. And we'll begin our panel presentation in a moment. Um, but before we do, uh, I just want to mention um, that during the panel presentation, we will turn the chat off. And we do that just to maintain uh, this notion of presence. Um, and so we're encouraging everyone to stay in the present moment um, as we hear from um, our esteemed uh, panelists, Dr. Plito, uh, Ms. Liu, um, and I guess I'll include myself in there as well. And so with that, uh, we'll move over to the panel presentation. Hey, everyone. Okay, well, welcome, everyone. Um, I, I, Elizabeth, I'm gonna start with you, okay? Um, you know, we use the term trauma casually these days, um, but what do we mean when we say that someone has been traumatized? What are the symptoms? And are the symptoms different for children um, versus um, adults? Sure. Um, well, before I start, I did want to just say thank you. That was an incredibly relaxing exercise. So I very much appreciate that. Um, when we talk about trauma, we're referencing usually an event. Whereas when we say someone is traumatized or if we diagnose them with a trauma disorder or even PTSD, we're recognizing that the trauma has begun to manifest within the body. Um, we know that unprocessed trauma especially can show itself as emotional or behavioral disturbances. For some people that may look like anxiety or depression, um, increased irritability and anger, and for others, it may look like an absence of emotion, withdrawal, or even numbness. Children can certainly experience all of these things, but they usually have a more limited vocabulary than adults. And so I think they have trouble expressing themselves with words a lot of times and instead use their bodies. Um, many of my own clients and the children we work with at the New York Foundling have been diagnosed with ADHD, and other behavioral disorders that are likely connected to the trauma that they've experienced. Um, the takeaway though, is that trauma is stored within the body and it can present itself in many, many different ways. Thank you. And, and to continue to familiarize ourselves with the terms that we're using today, I'm gonna to turn to Mary and, and ask Mary to, um, help us understand what we mean when we when we talk about 
secondary traumatic stress or vicarious trauma? And how is this kind of stress different from the normal ex experience of stress we have every day? Um, and certainly the kind that comes that we can expect from working with children and families. Thank you, Shirley. And first from the NYSPCC, I just wanna thank everyone that's attending this webinar for choosing to do the work that you're doing. It's needed more than ever during the pandemic. And I just am very grateful for everyone that continues to come back and give their all to protect children uh, throughout this, this really difficult time. And regarding the terms of, uh, you know, Elizabeth just gave the definition of trauma. Well, trauma is very different than stress. The way I define stress is how your body reacts to everything that's coming at it 24 seven. You know, so it could be finances, it could be an argument at home, it could be your car doesn't work, or, you know, you have to go grocery shopping, but you're, you forgot your mask and you have to go back. I mean, those are all just regular stresses that we encounter every single day. But if they start building up, you have to take notice of them because that will then heighten your anxiety and you will be less effective at work and you have to get a handle on, well, why am I reading the same thing three times, but I'm not registering it? Or why am I irritable when someone walks through the door and I'm not my you know, normal welcoming self? But that's stress. Stress is how your body's reacting to normal things coming at it 24 seven. When we're talking about secondary traumatic stress, that comes from someone taking in other people's trauma. And we all in our profession every single day have to, we have empathy. That's why we do this work. We have exposure to other people's trauma. And when we constantly take in other people's trauma due to this work, we can start to have some of the symptoms very much as Elizabeth said, present in our bodies, in our minds, of the same type of symptoms that our patients or clients who are traumatized have. So our patients have the primary trauma, the clinicians, the therapists, the caseworkers, the attorneys that are working with the clients would have secondary trauma. So they could have, they could wait, have dreams of what's going on with their client. They could begin to numb a bit because they're, they don't want to bring it home and, and they, they don't want to spread the upset that they have at work. So the, the numbing, the avoiding an area where maybe someone told them something happened, they begin to see that they have these symptoms and it's normal. It, you can't possibly do this work and take in all other people's trauma without having this. And the good news is secondary trauma can be managed and it can be prevented. Well, uh, let me follow up with you a little bit, Mary. How has COVID-19 um, changed what you know, professionals working with children and families normally experience? and the kinds of trauma they might experience or stress? Sure, well, first of all, the pandemic, COVID-19 has upended all semblance of normalcy for, for all of us, all right? So the clients' needs that we're seeing are much more challenging. We were all thrown, or many of us were thrown into remote work. Unfortunately, some of us or our family members and particularly our clients had no work. Home life is more challenging now. There's People trying to have their offices at home. People are trying to school their children at home. Um, there's economic uncertainty that also just doesn't impact the clients, can also impact all of us doing this work. Um, there's fear of getting sick. There's fear of bringing COVID home. The vaccines are rolling out, you know, but, but there's, you know, new strains coming in. And so all of these types of things start to impact us, which is why self-care is so important because We've all had losses. We've all had to face adjustments. We have increased levels of worry and frustration and grief, particularly if we've lost people that we care about during COVID. And the uncertainty is, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to manage and we don't know exactly what this new normal is going to look like. So, you know, at a time when we have to support others, we need support ourselves, which is why we really need to sort of harness 
and heighten our self-care during this. And then, you know, there's also the, the concept of shared trauma that I know Derek is going to talk about. And, and that also, you know, that's an added layer um, that all of us are, have to deal with collectively during this time. Thank you, Mary. Let, Derek, let me bring you into this now. And, and thank you for that really lovely relaxation exercise and a way of opening us today. Um, but uh, as we discuss these definitions, um, can you tell us a little bit about what shared trauma or collective trauma is and what the effects of that are? Um, perhaps using some examples like the um, you know, during um, uh, Hurricane Katrina, when people were experiencing so much loss, but also working with people who would experience so much loss. Absolutely, yeah. You know, shared trauma um, is when we experience primary trauma and also secondary trauma. Um, so what I mean by that is, for example, you know, in this uh, novel coronavirus pandemic, um, we as professionals are not only experiencing trauma through the empathy that we have for our clients, so we're experiencing in a way what our clients are experiencing, but we're also going through this pandemic ourselves, right? Um, so not only are we observing the fact that our clients may have lost uh, loved ones and are having um, maladaptive responses to um, that loss, but many of us have experienced loss as well. And so that brings up a lot uh, in terms of, uh, um, in terms of uh, for professionals. So for example, uh, when I think about countertransference, right? Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I think is very interesting when we look, for example, at the research um, is examples of a few concepts that we've been talking about already. Um, so one, um, there was a recent study by um, Laura Abrams, who's the Dean of uh, UCLA's Social Work School, and Alan Detloff, who is the Dean of the University of Houston's uh, School of Social Work. And they interviewed 16 social work graduates. And they were talking about, you know, what were their experiences during this current pandemic uh, that we've um, are experiencing. So we're really getting at, you know, what are their experiences of secondary traumatic stress? And what they said is that they really bore witness to the struggles of, you know, very marginalized, very vulnerable, isolated um, clients, right? And so they watched their clients get infected with the virus. Um, they watched them struggle and tried to help them get access to quality care. Um, these were all things that were, you know, very emotionally taxing for um, clinicians and um, had them, you know, really questioning certain things as well, um, because again, countertransference may have been going on for them. And so when we um, look at, for example, another study by um, a colleague of mine, John McKay, um, who's at Ramapo College, um, and um, his colleague, Carol um, Tassone, who's at NYU, they um, uh, did a study of 139 uh, clinical social workers um, who were um, uh, living in New York City and working in New York City um, during 9-11. And they, what, we, what they found in this study was they were experiencing um, trauma themselves, right? That uh, they it, were talking about how they were forever changed from 9-11. Um, that, and I believe many of us can relate to this, they can remember exactly what they were doing when the towers went down. Um, and they also reported that they had post-traumatic growth. Um, so, the positive thing in a way is that they thought, you know what, there are more important things in life. Um, so um, they saw the towers go down and they started reinvesting in personal relationships. They let some of the petty things that were happening in their lives go. 
Um, but another thing that they found, and the reason why I brought up counter-transference earlier, is that they found that they had a different relationship with their clients that impacted their practice going for forward. The mm -hmm. clear boundaries that they had between themselves and their clients blurred because they had all had this shared experience. And so when we, I'm just gonna share one more study because I think it really gets at this idea of shared trauma. Um, Carol Tassone, who I just mentioned and some other colleagues um, did a study um, uh, around Hurricane Katrina and talked about um, not only the personal impact, um, but also the uh, professional impact of Hurricane Katrina. What they found, and I'll just sum this up really quickly, um, is that they found that professionals um, who had um, what we can characterize um, as an insecure adult attachment um, had lower levels of resilience when they experienced stress from Hurricane Katrina. Um, and so they had a more difficult time bouncing back from um, adversity, in this case, in trying to cope with the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Um, <clears throat> and this left them more vulnerable to shared trauma symptoms, um, to secondary stress, to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I bring up this study um, to highlight that um, it's not only what we experience in the moment from these traumatic events, it's not only what our empathy has exposed us to to this trauma, but it's also what we carry from our history, right? From our attachment styles as children that we grow into, the way we approach relationships, all of this informs um, our um, experience in our work. Thank you, Derek. I mean, to summarize very quickly, it sounds like no one has 100% immunity. And so being exposed to trauma, you know, firsthand and secondhand at the second time will really affect each of us possibly in different ways, but we can expect it to affect our professional work. So mm -hmm. um, with that in mind, I'm gonna turn now to Elizabeth and to Mary and pose the question to you, what can we do as professionals um, to make sure that, you know, we're still delivering quality services to the children and families we're working with? Because we know we're all vulnerable and, um, where, where can we start to, you know, um, keep ourselves as professional and high quality as possible? I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in. Well, first of all, I, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, if you look at your code of ethics, I know as I'm a social worker, but the NASW, they have a self, self care is written into the code of ethics that we have a responsibility to take care of ourselves because we have to come back at the top of our, of our game day after day. So I know sometimes we feel all oh, we can only take care of ourselves on the weekend or when we get, when we get a break at night, but that's, that's really not accurate. You have to do something all the time to make sure that you're coming back with the energy you need to deal with the serious problems that the clients that are facing right now. You know, the other thing I, I was, um, doing a training for uh, people that work with uh, clients who commit sexual offenses. And I had the chance to really talk with, about them about what their day is like recently. And what they were saying to me is, you know, we get up at five o'clock in the morning and it's five o'clock in the afternoon and we're still working. You know, we don't have that get up, go to work, leave work, come home boundaries anymore. And we need to make sure that during this time that we are creating those boundaries so that we do have time to regroup. I mean, you know, some of the other things that I think are really important that jump out at me are you need to get supervision. And if you're not able to get it at your agency, you need to figure out, is it peer supervision? Do you, you know, where can you get supervision? Is it a, is it a professional group? We all have things that we need support on and we need to talk to, and they usually make us feel much better, you know, but it also needs, we need to be normalized and validated that the things that we're experiencing and the, sometimes the sadness or grief that we're experiencing are okay to experience during this, you know, and we, we have to realize that, that this is, this is part of what 
is happening when we're going through a pandemic along with the rest of the world, but we have an extra responsibility to take care of ourselves, to take care of others. You know, you put your own oxygen mask on first. If you can access therapy, this is, you know, therapy right now, it's so easy to access. You can get it online, you can get it on Zoom, you can get it on your phone. You know, there's call-in numbers all the time. And I tell people, if you're not in therapy or if you tr want to try it, this is a good time. If you were in therapy, go back for a booster shot, I call them. You know, it's, it's always, I think, just a good way to take care of yourself and, and get some, you know, a boost to your resiliency. Um, there's also, uh, I think we have to practice some of the things with uh, that we have with our clients. We have to practice reframing on days where we wake up and we're just like not in the mood. Don't want to do another Zoom call. Don't want to deal with this client. And I think sometimes you have to positive reframe and say, you know what, these are negative thoughts. Let me switch. Let me do some of the meditations and the beautiful things Derek was talking about to center ourselves so that we, we you know, we can go forward. Um, I put it, uh, all right, there will be in the chat a self-care assessment. It's a self-care inventory that we use in the sessions that um, the NYSPCC provides both to New York City Child Protective Services, and I use them in all my secondary um, traumatic stress trainings. But it really looks at all the ways clinicians and therapists can take care of themselves. Because normally when we talk about how do we, how do we regroup, people go to physical, physical self-care, but there's much more to coming back and really being able to support others. You have to have psychological self-care. You know, there's emotional self-care, spiritual self-care and workplace self-care. And I think, you know, if, if you want to just go through this checklist and just look at the areas, oh, I'm doing pretty good in this area, but you know what, I'm not doing so good in with, um, you know, uh, trying new things or the emotional self-care, just, just trying to give myself affirmations. You know, we always, we go to the negative, let's go to the positive. We are doing tremendous work in a very difficult time and we need to have those prideful moments or as my agency calls them, sunbursts to realize that we, you know, our, we are doing a lot of good as well. And I think we need to take stock of that. But the workplace or professional self-care, um, you know, those are other things, you know, set limits with, turn off your phone, I'm gonna say, and then I will let Elizabeth, but there's two more things I just have to get in here. Turn off your phone at night. Unless you're on call or it's an emergency, everything's gonna be there in the morning. You don't need the bing, 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 making you run across the thing, grab your phone, what's on there. You need to chill out at night, turn the phone off. And the second thing I'm going to say, which I know people are gonna have a harder time with, but I, I do it and it's, it was hard for me at first, turn off the news. Watch the news 15 minutes in the morning, watch the news 15 minutes at night. There is no good news. All the news is negative and we take in so much stress and negativity and chaos and catastrophe that happens to clients day in, day out. We don't need to keep taking in an extra diet of it on our off hours. That will add to both our stress level and our secondary traumatic stress level. Put on a comedy, watch the Yankees. I live in the Bronx. Watch, you know, watch the Mets. You know, but um, watch, put on something with laughter and it will music, put on music and it will really make a difference in how you're even able to eat your dinner. So that's my, <laughs> that's my advice. <laughs> well, that's that. great advice, Mary. <laughs> yeah, I think you, and so comprehensive. <laughs> Elizabeth, maybe we could focus more at like what's happening at New York Foundling, you know, what's being provided. I, I mean, I am sure no doubt as a manager, you have a lot of this to deal with, um, with you know the professionals you're supervising. So maybe you could tell us about what New York Foundling has been doing to, to help um, its professionals. Sure, I mean, I kind of have an interesting role at the Foundling. I supervise some social work interns 
and some administrative staff. And then I have a, a caseload of my own, which I feel very lucky to have a caseload of children who are highly entertaining and provide me <laughs> with a lot of laughter <laughs> in my sessions. So kind of as Mary was saying, you know, we can identify our pain, but I always tell my clients, you don't need to suffer. And I imagine that, you know, sitting in front of the TV with the news or going to bed and hearing that buzz, it's just causing unnecessary stress. Mm -hmm. um, but one of my favorite things about, you know, working at the Foundling is just that my coworkers are incredibly uh, resilient and supportive of one another. Mm -hmm. And um, even before the pandemic, as um, child welfare workers, we're exposed to loss and grief on a pretty mm -hmm. regular basis. Um, you know, loss and grief are inescapable in life. But um, I feel that we've been kind of, you know, primed to deal with this and we're constantly helping others cope with their own healing process. You know, the clients, the children we serve, families we serve, um, which is, you know, in I conceptualize it as finding meaning in the trauma that we're all experiencing. Um, and then just practical things, the foundling's been really wonderful in supporting staff in terms of giving us additional sick time, promoting wellness events, lots of meditation, exercise, yoga, things like that, that we can do virtually as well, um, allowing us to work from home when possible, which I find as much as it can sometimes blur the lines between personal and professional. It also can be really beneficial in, in making our work-life balance better. You know, for me, I don't have to do that hour, hour and a half commute every day um, to work. So there have been a lot of things. And then also one of, you know, as Mary said, also getting professional help, I think is so important. Um, and one of the things that New York Foundling has done before the pandemic and also has continued to um, promote is free counseling sessions. You know, our insurance is covers therapy sessions, but we also have an added benefit of complimentary uh, family sessions for a period of time during you know stressful situations or at you know the leisure of the of the employees. That sounds great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Derek, we're gonna, I'm going to turn to you, to um, many of the participants today are students and, um, you know, they have field placements going on as well as, you know, academic courses they're taking and, um, and also many of our students also have jobs that they're working at at the same time while they take care of families. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about um, students who are, you know, resources available to students who are experiencing vicarious trauma um, in their field work or who are just having trouble connecting um, to, to the individuals they're working with. Absolutely, yeah. You know, in the academic courses that I teach, I'm, I'm seeing students who have gotten infected with the virus themselves, either through their field work or through their employment, um, and uh, supporting family members who have gotten infected. It's a really stressful time for them, like everyone has been saying. And, you know, one of the um, resources that I mentioned that, you know, is not often always thought about because I think the question around accessibility, affordability comes up is counseling. And, you know, uh, institutions of higher education have free counseling centers. Um, and so oftentimes I will refer my students to them. Um, but I think sometimes our students don't even know if they're experiencing secondary trauma. They don't even know if they need help. Um, and so, you know, in the um, assessment process, I love the self-care inventory that um, Mary mentioned. And I think um, as a precursor to that um, particular, you know, survey, the professional quality of life um, inventory is something that can be very helpful because it lets us know, are we, really suffering from secondary traumatic stress? Are we suffering from burnout? It's something easily accessible online uh, that we can uh, refer to and give us a sense because oftentimes when we're traumatized, uh, we're dissociated. So we don't actually know that we're suffering. Um, and this will highlight for us um, that we might have a need. 
Um, <clears throat> you know, also, I want to highlight some of the things that both um, Mary and Elizabeth were talking about in terms of at their field placements. I cannot stress the you know, importance of supervision um, and using our supervisors to not only guide us um, in terms of how to manage our caseloads, how to you know, support our clients through their troubling times, but how to support us professionally. Um, and so I think turning to our field supervisors is something that's uh, incredibly important. I think other things um, are important that you know show um, efficacy in the research, which is around you know thinking continuing education um, as um, self care. Oftentimes we don't think about that as self care, but attuning to something new or in learning something new and being present in that moment while we're learning uh, is incredibly helpful, and oftentimes these, you know, great agencies, um, you know, uh, avail us these opportunities for continuing education. Um, I've had a little bit of difference with um, some mindfulness um, resources that are out there. Um, I've been a little hesitant about something that I'm going to mention uh, in a moment, but I was a little surprised in a recent study that I was reading the other day uh, that was really talking about Headspace. Um, Headspace is an app. Uh, that you can use for meditation. Um, and it allows you to access some guided meditation whenever you might need it. Um, it can be expensive uh, for some students, but for those students who are able to afford the, I believe, $100 a year um, subscription, it's something that um, is a mindful activity that if you're not used to practicing mindfulness and have wanted to get into it, that can guide you in the process. And then, you know, one other thing that I want to um, highlight um, is something that I enjoy doing and something that was affirmed in research for me, which is I love hiking. And um, some recent studies have really highlighted the importance of spending time in nature, spending time outdoors, getting outdoor every day, taking a break leaving your, I leave my phone at home. You think you can't live without it, but you really can. And just taking a step out and, you know, going for a walk um, or, uh, you know, going for a longer walk, one hour a day in nature has research support behind it of lowering your stress. Just doing that one time a week. I think everyone can find time for that and it's free. So um, those are some of the things that I would uh, suggest. Well, thank you, Derek. I mean, you bring up an important point of um, not only being in nature, because not everyone has access to, to be out in nature all the time, but just going out, doing some exercise, leaving your phone behind, right? Yeah, and if, it, if it's at a walk in an urban area, that, that's still removing you and getting you physically moving from you know, that the, the room that you have all your Zoom calls or <laughs> your classes or uh, where you're seeing uh, the clients that you're working with. I'm going to move us to a next question and um, have us look a little bit into the future. I'll start with Mary, but I invite you all to, you know, to chime in. Um, so what do you think the long-term effects of COVID are going to be on the child welfare workforce. We've all been working differently. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think we're, we're, we're not out of it yet. And I think that's, that's a question that we're going to have to grapple with for a long time coming. But, you know, there's obviously, there's been tremendous impact on the children and the families that we work with. And many of them, I think, are going to be even more hard hit by economic challenges, food insecurity, um, job insecurity, housing insecurity. So I think we, we need to gear up to try to figure out how can we provide as many ongoing resources at a time when funding is also you know, difficult to, to come by for a lot of nonprofits that are doing this work. So I think that'll be a challenge. I think another challenge for the child welfare sort of system in general is we have to look at um, what were, were there barriers to reporting child abuse and neglect or barriers to reporting domestic violence 
And we did come up with some innovative ways to try to break through those barriers during the pandemic, but could we be doing more? And how do we do more? I think we need, you know, another challenge is going to be the ongoing need for PPE and social distancing. And what does that mean for our clients and our, uh, and, and our staff? Um, the NYSPCC was able to very quickly and nimbly move to remote services for our trauma recovery clinic and for our supervised visitation program. We're now going to be going back into a hybrid model of providing some services in person and some remotely. And I think another thing that um, we need to think about ongoing terms is that um, I wasn't sure remote services were going to work. I was a skeptic. I was the one, you know, what? no, no, it has to be face-to-face -face in the office. That's the best way. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, we had better participation from the teenagers with some of the trauma sessions when they, when we went remote, we were able to crack that nut of doing supervised visits remotely, you know, so now we will go back, but we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. There is, a, there is a place for remote services, for virtual services, and maybe it's a snowy day when, when you don't want a client that has an infant coming into the office and you can do remote work. You know, and, and so we're going to look and see, um, I think a challenge for the future is where does the virtual work fit in and where does the, the face to face fit in. Um, but th I think those are just some of the challenges that that we'll see in the, in the coming year. And I, I also think, you know, just fundraising in general and keeping staff safe and keeping staff morale up is also, you know, going to be something that we all have to work harder at and taking care of ourselves. Anyone else? Uh, I was just gonna add, I, I agree. I definitely wouldn't want to um, discount all of the, the very painful experiences we've all gone through over this past uh, year and a half now. Um, but I think on a positive note, I have seen that both my colleagues and I, our families and children have really expanded their use of coping mechanisms. They've learned new ways to cope. And then as Mary said, I was also a skeptic in the beginning. So it's made me feel like, okay, I should be more positive from the outset. Um, in child welfare, we have children who are in foster care well beyond their teenage years um, and into their early twenties. So, um, and we also have a lot of children who unfortunately move between boroughs. And in the past, we've had to switch therapists or switch case planning teams. And so with the virtual um, abilities that we have, it's really um, opened up a lot of doors. If we don't have a therapist in one borough who's available, we can have the client see someone tomorrow over uh, teams. Um, in another borough. And again, if we have youth who go off to college, they can still maintain a connection with their therapist back um, home. So that's been great. So interesting. So in this time of great uncertainty, we've had more permanence in some ways, <laughs> you know, more continuity in some ways. Um, so uh, I'm gonna open the next question to, to all of you. Um, and I would like to end on a positive note. So I'm gonna ask you all, what would you like to tell um, child and family workers who have gone through tough times during this pandemic um, that would make them feel better uh, about the work that they're doing and what lies ahead? Do you wanna start us off, Derek? Sure. Um, you know, I would really uh, stress that um, and focus on the adaptability and resilience that um, you all have shown in an incredibly uh, tough and challenging time. Um, it what it's um, in my mind a miracle to be able to, as Mary and Elizabeth were saying, switch to online work, really reinvent in some ways all the ways that this long-standing field has learned how to work and support. Uh, uh, these children and families in a very quick time period. And I find that amazing. I think everyone should be um, incredibly proud of themselves of how they've been able to respond to this crisis and supporting 
um, uh, children and their families. So. I'll, I'll definitely second Derek. I echo everything that you say and add my praise. And I, I just, again, as I said at the opening, you know, I really want to thank everyone that chooses to come every single day to do this work. There's a lot of, you know, different things that we could all be doing. And, and this is to me, I mean, this is my passion and it's obvious that it's everyone that's on this call, it's their passion too. And if you can just take one or two of the things that we all talked about today in terms of self-care and just try to work them into your routine so that you do boost your resiliency and you do come back stronger um, and, and look at the prideful moments, you know, sit back at the end of the day and look at something that went well this week. You know, we always, we tend to go to the negative, but let's, let's go to the positive and all the good that's coming out of the work that all of you are doing all the time. It's to be commended. You know, the children need you, the families need you. And, you know, it's, it's just in my mind, you know, they are blessed that you have decided to do this work. So again, you know, from the NYSPCC, just thank you so much for being part of, you know, <laughs> keeping children and families safe and healthy. Elizabeth? Yeah, I'll just finish off. I think that all of us social workers, healthcare workers, child welfare workers are really great at compartmentalizing. And I think that's a great way, a great protective factor, but also it's really important to maintain support um, from people, important people in your life and maintain a connection with them. And so I try to think in all the different compartments you have, your professional and your personal and your pleasurable, you know, maintains at least one person in each of those compartments who can really be a supportive person in your life. What a nice thought. <laughs> Um, so it, it sounds like um, it, this year has, you know, we've all experienced a lot of hardship, but it's also presented itself with opportunities for growth. And I know that I've learned a great deal from our panelists today, and um, I truly appreciate it. And I hope that others have as well. And um, again, uh, you know, to echo what Mary was saying, this is all in appreciation for the great work that um, that every you know all child and family workers have been doing um, for us. And so I just want to remind you that um, you know in celebration, let's say, of National Child Abuse Prevention Month, um, we will be holding um, we'll be hosting uh, three self care sessions. They're 30 minutes long, um, the first of which will be next Monday, led by Derek. And um, come during your lunch hour, just turn everything else off and, you know, take a half an hour for yourself. Um, we have one on Wednesday, April 21st, by another faculty member at Fordham. And the, file, the final one is um, Namaste Wellness that has been working with New York Foundling. Um, so we hope that you can, uh, and here's how you register. You can go to the Fordham website um, and um, uh, you should also receive the flyer in your email if you're interested in joining us. Um, so I do hope that you do take the time to take care of yourselves and um, now I think we have time for a question and, and answer. Hello, everyone. My name is Leslie. I'm the director of the New York Foundling Vincent J. Fontana Center. I've been reading all your questions. There are a ton of them, so I'm going to get right to them and let our panelists answer them. So um, one question that came through was uh, one of the attendees that they often struggle with the balance of wanting to share what is going through, what, what share what they're going through with their clients in order to let them know that they feel their pain without oversharing and taking over the conversation. They want to know what you think about sharing personal stories of their own struggle and trauma with their clients. Do you have any thoughts about that? This is to all the panelists. So whoever has an idea first, please let me know. I think that um, I would, you know, we, we are, I think that I would um, 
advise that when we share personal stories about ourselves that we use it in a very strategic way. So I think that we need to look at, you know, what is the outcome we're trying to achieve by sharing this personal story? Um, I think we also need to reflect on how often are we using ourselves in this way in our practice? Um, if we find that we're starting to do it too much, and if you have a feeling like maybe you are oversharing, it could be a possibility uh, that you are. Um, and that's something that you would want to take to supervision um, and um, process with your supervisor. Those are some of my initial thoughts, but I'll continue to think about it. No, I agree with, with what Derek is saying. Um, and I think although we would, because again, this is a shared trauma, a collective trauma, there would be a tendency to overshare, but we have to remember that the clients that are coming to us have so many challenges and so many fears that we really probably would should think very carefully before adding to their burden about what's going on with, with our own with our own fears and our own challenges. Thank you. Um, a couple of people asked um, questions about this, so I'll make it a two-part question. Um, how does trauma look different in teens than with younger children? And how do you encourage self-care in those younger children? Hmm. Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I um, I love working with teenagers, which I know is is rare. Um, it seems. I think for teenagers, they it's a it's a time in life where they're often misunderstood to begin with, and so you know they don't really want to talk to their parents about what's going on anyway, and having to talk about additional trauma um, can be even more challenging for them um, and it and it might make them feel even more marginalized like there's something wrong with them um, which they're fighting but I think for teenagers one of the biggest things is their, their social network is so important to them and I think encouraging children especially teenagers to talk to their own friends I would say you know what about your own friends what are they dealing with have you have you told them about what you're feeling I find that a lot of uh, teenagers are very can be very supportive of one another. Um, so at the Foundling, we actually start. I guess it's already been a year ago. We did a teen group where we had, you know, I was really just moderating, and we had the teens talk about what they were going through with the pandemic and being out of school. And I found that to be so helpful, just because they were more likely probably to listen to each other than to me. And then with little kids. Um, one of the biggest things I've noticed is just not having time as much time to run around and play outside has been really, really tough for them. Um, so any opportunity I can take kids to the park during a session or have them run around in our affiliate school's gym. Well, that's like self-care for them. They can just literally run back and forth against the walls and circles. And it's like, I can just tell the the stress inside their bodies is just completely being expressed, um, you know, through that physical activity. Okay, um, another question that came through is, um, somebody wanted to elaborate on trauma related to shared trauma for mainly, mainly related to race issues that are happening right now. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> it's when we talk about events and trauma as experience and response to events and also shared trauma uh, in terms of um, we can look at the George Floyd incident um, as an event. We can look at the AAPI attacks recently um, as an event, right? And these events, of course, impact our clients, but also us. Um, and I think the challenge really becomes, again, um, in a way, over identifying with the experience of um, our clients. And I think Mary said it so well earlier, 
when you know we're talking about um, our experience and if we were to share our story or commiserate with our clients about these experiences in the pandemic, um, which are coupled by um, these um, experiences of oppression, I think it colors their experience if we start to share our experience with them. Um, and that can be uh, very uh, uh, challenging. And I think it also speaks to the fact that we do need to engage in self-care um, in certain ways of like tapping our peer networks. And so uh, one of the things that has been uh, incredibly helpful, I think, um, at Fordham GSS is, you know, this year we started some affinity groups. And these affinity groups within our organizations have helped to um, process what has happened um, in response to um, some of these very traumatic uh, racialized uh, events. And inherently in the discussions that happen in these affinity groups, we're also talking about the novel coronavirus pandemic and how it's disproportionately impacting our communities and you know what are we doing to take care of ourselves. So I say that in a way to engage in those types of groups with our peers. So we take that um, need to kind of process um, with someone away from the focus on our clients and taking it with uh, to our peers, which can be, which is needed, um, which I think is necessary um, and which I know um, is um, incredibly uh, therapeutic. Thank you. Um, so another question that came through, a couple of questions about this. Um, what are some ways that managers and supervisors can get ahead of supervisees struggling with vicarious and secondary trauma and stress? And they're also asking, how do you offer resources to them besides yourself without being intrusive? So what can you do with the people you supervise? Mary and A, you were talking about uh, being a supervisor and doing and working in that sense too. You know, I think that the first thing that that your your staff need is they need to know that secondary trauma is natural, normal, and it's going to happen, and it needs to be validated and normalized. I think supervisors also need to look at. Um, what are, and talk about what are the reactions that the staff are having? How often are they having them? Are there certain cases that are more triggering for them for others? What is their caseload like? How is their caseload balanced? You know, um, uh, it would be really great if, in fact, I was having this conversation the other day with a supervisor um, regarding having some of the therapists not only doing the supervised visitation and the a trauma recovery clinic, but how important it is that they also do the parenting group and that they also do the puppet show in the schools with, with happy children, you know, thrilled to see the puppets. Although we're doing it virtually right now, it's still something that, that, that changes and that you, you look at the balance of the caseload, but you have to make this a, a, a regular conversation. This can't just be, um, you know, that when this comes up, I think, um, you, there's also once a month, you know, one of the, the clinical meetings is geared around self-care and what, what extra supports can do people need. Um, but I think, again, it's, it's a question of making sure people are comfortable with the topic, comfortable discussing it, have a self-care plan, have, be encouraged um, to talk about self-care. I start my supervisions, I have them all sort of straight down on Monday morning with how was your weekend? What did you do? What was, you know, tell, tell me you know, what you did that was great or how you enjoyed yourself. Because I do want, you, you need that break. This work is hard, you know, and, and, and the supervisors have to sort of, you know, be there willing to talk about it, validate it, normalize it. And then also, I think, put systems in place for people that are struggling with how, you know, and look at, do they need more training? Do they need workshops? Do they need a varied caseload? You know, what, what is it that, uh, you know, is something triggering them? Should, you know, and, and therefore, um, you know, that needs to be discussed. And, and what, does, what does that mean? So I think it's, it's supervisors also have to be trained and comfortable in having these conversations. 
Thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to affirm uh, what Mary said. I was I came across a research study recently of effective interventions for vicarious trauma for um, uh, helping professionals, and it really talked about that the most effective thing are. Um, psychoeducation sessions where you're able to talk about vicarious trauma and it's integrated um, into it with peer support and also uh, mindfulness uh, trainings as well. Um, so uh, for organizations that have the capacity to be able to bring um, something like that in, that's something that could be very efficacious. Um, so I think we have enough time for probably one more question. Um, a couple people from the beginning of the of the talk wanted some clarification on um, explaining post-traumatic growth more. And just in general, post-traumatic stress, somebody mentioned that um, how could it be post-traumatic stress if there's co constantly trauma happening? When is the post occur? So a little bit more on post-traumatic growth and then kind of explaining the idea of post-traumatic stress. I mean, I would just say quickly for post-traumatic stress, we're really talking about the post is the post, the trauma. Um, that doesn't mean that it just ends. Um, trying to think about how, uh, for one thing, it's important to know, uh, we, normally when you, get to the point where you're having PTSD, you're meeting, meeting certain criteria of symptoms related to a trauma you've experienced, but that certainly doesn't mean that you've been, um, you've fully processed the trauma, which is why you have that diagnosis. Um, and I think that's an important point because at least in child welfare, um, there are a lot of trauma-focused therapies, which are great, but it's also, essential to recognize if a child is, especially if a child or an adult is still experiencing trauma, it is very difficult and probably not recommended to start working on a, you know, TFCBT or some kind of therapeutic in intervention until the child or person is in a safe place. And that's when you can start working on processing it and healing from that trauma. Thank you. Um, ending with uh, two easy questions. One, uh, there are a couple people have asked for the author of the meditation reading that you did <laughs> earlier. Sure. It's from the book, The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and the author is um, Swami Sachi Tananda. Um, I will, let's see if I can put it in the chat. Yeah. Thank you so much. And Mary, somebody else is asking how often they should use that, um, the inventory you sent earlier. Uh, I think that they should look at that inventory as often as possible and just fill it out the first time. And you actually scored and you say, all right, I'm not doing so good in spiritual. I'm doing great in physical. Um, and then I would just try, if you're seeing that one category, you're really falling short. Maybe just like, you know, once every week, just pick something from another category and just try it. You don't have to tackle it all at once, nor, nor do I think it's, it's you're possible. But, you know, I mean, if I, I have it right here in front of me, but, you know, um, uh, let's see, get enough sleep, try going to bed an hour earlier, eat healthy. You know, that's what, you know, the, they're saying the quarantine 15. So maybe make little tweaks to your diet engaged in personal psychotherapy. These are, you know, just take one from each category, you know, allow time for reflection, reread your favorite book or favorite movie. I don't know. I've been watching the great British cooking show in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen every, every one of them 10 times, but they make me happy. So I, I think that, you know, pick one or two things in, you know, every, every, you know, every week or so that you're just willing to try. And that would be a great start and turn off your phone at night. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, um, everyone. Thank you, everyone.
And thank, thank you, you to our panelists and Leslie, thank you. And thank you everyone for the work you're doing and for joining us today.